Welcome to Six in the A. This is Chao Wei Huang of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and of the Frederick Health Hospital. Today we're going to talk about optimal duration of balloon inflation. Going up. For all of us who work in the cath lab, this is a phrase that we use nearly every day. But the question is, how long should we actually keep the balloon up when we're deploying a stent? There have been a number of papers published looking at this question. Back in 2013, uh, Thomas Hovas and colleagues uh, looked at 104 consecutive patients where they looked at uh, stent expansion at 5 seconds, 15 seconds, and 25 seconds uh, using uh, uh, digital stent enhancement technology and measured the average uh, stent diameter. And they found that stent diameter uniformly increased uh, the longer you kept the balloon up. 15 seconds was better than 5 seconds, and 25 seconds was better than 15 seconds. And this is true regardless of whether you were looking at the minimal stent diameter, the maximal stent diameter, or the average stent diameter. Now, in this study, uh, they only controlled uh, for the stent balloon inflation time. The inflation pressure, whether you did predilation, whether you did postdilation, uh, was completely left up to the operator. And of note, only 44% of lesions were predilated and only 29% of stents were postdilated. So the authors concluded uh, that the duration of stent balloon inflation has a significant impact on stent expansion, and they recommended stent deployment for at least 25 seconds. Now, 25 seconds does seem somewhat arbitrary. Valoropoli and colleagues uh, published a series of papers in which they suggested that the duration that the balloon is kept inflated should not be based on an arbitrary time cutoff, uh, but instead uh, should be based on whether there is a downward pressure drift uh, uh, in the endoflator during uh, balloon inflation. In other words, a pressure decay. Uh, the idea is that if there is a pressure decay, that implies that the balloon is still expanding and therefore that the stent has not fully expanded yet. So they call their protocol the uh, pressure optimization protocol, or POP. And the way it works is that they perform high pressure stent balloon inflation and then watch the endoflator dial uh, for a pressure decay of more than 0.3 atmospheres in a 30 second period. If there, if, if that happens, uh, if there is a decay, then they reinflate the endoflator uh, to the target pressure and keep watching again. And they keep repeating that cycle until there is no further pressure decay, and at which point uh, the stent is presumed to be fully expanded and the balloon is then deflated. So this is how this protocol would work. Uh, you inflate the balloon to the target pressure, and you watch your endoflator dial for downward pressure drift. Once the pressure drift reaches 0.3 atmospheres, you reinflate to the target pressure, and you watch for drift again. Um, and you keep doing that uh, until you see that there is no further downward drift, at which point you assume the stent is fully expanded, and you deflate the balloon. So back in 2014, uh, the authors used OCT uh, to look at uh, how use of this protocol affected stent expansion as well as affected uh, stent malposition and the number of malopose struts. And in all instances, uh, the use of this pressure optimization protocol resulted in better stent expansion and lesser degree of stent or strut malposition compared uh, to uh, a, the standard rapid uh, inflation uh, deflation uh, protocol. Now, the use of this protocol does result in a dramatically long uh, balloon inflation time. In fact, the average inflation time uh, in their clinical study was 104.7 seconds uh, using this uh, pressure optimization protocol versus 18.4 seconds uh, using standard uh, inflation deflation. The uh, histogram of this uh, balloon inflation time uh, showed that you had uh, inflation times from anywhere from 30 seconds all the way up to a couple of uh, patients who had uh, over 380 uh, seconds of uh, balloon inflation time. Now, with the markedly increased uh, balloon inflation time of the uh, pressure optimization protocol, uh, about 2.9% of patients uh, required premature termination of inflation, and, and the majority of those uh, was due, uh, as expected, to severe chest pain or uh, severe ST elevations. 
Um, there were some adverse clinical events, uh, including uh, 21 uh, uh, cases of uh, periprocedural type 4 AMI, 4.8% uh, of the study of the 2016 study, uh, again, presumably uh, due to the long uh, uh, balloon inflations. Now, the other things of interest uh, are uh, the rate of post-dilation, the rate of pre-dilation. Um, for the rapid uh, uh, inflation-deflation patients, 54% uh, of those patients underwent post-dilation. Uh, for pressure optimization, only 14% underwent post-dilation. And uh, also interestingly, of the rapid inflation-deflation, less than half of them underwent pre-dilation, uh, whereas for pressure optimization, more than 80% underwent pre-dilation. Uh, this is actually somewhat uh, concerning, uh, considering that uh, adequate lesion preparation is uh, traditionally felt to be important uh, in, uh, 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 for a good uh, stent uh, expansion. All right, so here's the punchline. Um, the authors enrolled 792 patients who underwent PCI either using rapid inflation or deflation protocol and 376 patients or the pressure optimization protocol uh, 416 patients. Uh, their primary outcome was target vessel failure. And you can see from uh, this uh, uh, chart uh, that uh, uh, pressure optimization outperformed rapid inflation and deflation uh, from the very beginning with the curves continuing to separate all the way up to the uh, four-year time point. Uh, the same is true for target vessel revascularization, and both target vessel revascularization and target vessel failure had a statistically significant difference between the two protocols. Uh, there was uh, no uh, difference for myocardial infarction and no statistical difference for cardiac death, uh, although there was a trend uh, favoring uh, the pressure optimization protocol. The authors also looked at the effects of post-dilation. Uh, in this uh, analysis, uh, they looked at uh, comparing uh, rapid inflation deflation with no post-dilation uh, with rapid inflation deflation with post-dilation uh, versus the pressure optimization protocol without post-dilation and found that uh, there really was no significant difference between uh, post-dilation or no post-dilation in terms of um, a target vessel failure, although with a trend, uh, in this case, uh, benefiting uh, post-dilation. And compared to the pressure optimization protocol, um, they were both inferior um, uh, with a P uh, of 0.0001. So the authors concluded uh, that stent deployment uh, using pressure optimization protocol uh, led to reduce our target vessel failure uh, compared to rapid inflation and deflation protocol, uh, almost regardless of post dilation. And they uh, suggested uh, considering this uh, method uh, to uh, improve uh, long-term outcomes. Now, the unequal levels of predilation and lesion preparation between the rapid uh, inflation deflation groups and the pressure optimization group does, I think, limit uh, the interpretation of the conclusion uh, in the previous study. Now, uh, this group uh, uh, in 2020 uh, published this paper advocating their use of their uh, an intracoronary imaging uh, based uh, uh, strategy uh, for stent uh, uh, implantation. They call it the IPSP study uh, for intracoronary imaging guided predilation, stent sizing, and post dilation. And the idea is this, uh, you use intracoronary guidance uh, to look at the lesion uh, before you even start. And you're looking at calcification, uh, the plaque burden, uh, the configuration of the plaque, whether there are any side branches, and then you perform appropriate predilation, such as using a, a high pressure balloon, cutting balloons, or if necessary, uh, rotational atherectomy. And then after that, you uh, uh, use, uh, again, uh, intracoronary imaging to select your stent size and stent length um, and uh, to ensure uh, full lesion coverage and adequate sense, uh, stent diameter as well as stent uh, length. Uh, after you've deployed the stent, uh, you then again use intracoronary imaging uh, to look at stent apposition, stent area, whether there's any evidence of edge dissection, and then you treat accordingly uh, uh, with uh, appropriate post, uh, uh, post dilation uh, or uh, uh, further stenting to tack up any edge dissections. 
So their primary outcome was a composite of cardiac death, uh, target vessel MI or target vessel revascularization. And what they found was that using this IPSP protocol, um, the IPSP protocol had uh, far uh, fewer, uh, statistically significant fewer uh, incidents of target vessel failure uh, than the uh, patients that uh, did not uh, receive uh, this uh, protocol. And this was in a fairly large study of nearly 10,000 patients. And uh, looking at the relative importance of intravascular imaging for each of the components of IPSP, uh, predilation, stent sizing, and post-dilation, um, the authors found that uh, intravascular imaging was especially important uh, for guiding post-dilation, and perhaps less so uh, for guiding uh, pre-dilation. So here are some take-home messages. Uh, good lesion preparation is important. Uh, in my practice, I almost never uh, direct stent. Uh, I will pre-dilate with a balloon, or uh, if the lesion is especially calcified, uh, we'll perform um, rotational atherectomy, um, and hopefully uh, very soon in the future, uh, intravascular uh, lithotripsy. Um, for stent deployment, uh, I use a, a protocol that is similar uh, to the uh, pressure optimization protocol. Uh, we keep the balloon up and adjust the pressure until we don't see any further downward pressure drift uh, in the uh, endoflator. So I don't have a set uh, balloon inflation time. Um, we will also often do a second balloon inflation uh, just to confirm that there is in fact no further downward pressure drift. Uh, we almost always post dilate the stent and uh, use uh, intravascular imaging uh, liberally, especially to guide uh, post dilation. I also tend to favor OCT over IVIS uh, for the superior quality of the images. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, uh, please uh, subscribe to our channel.